that we do, we were praising the God who saved us and the Jesus who saved us. Uh, it's our response, our way of showing appreciation to that God, to Jesus, for all the amazing things that he does for us. Uh, so today in worship, let's show God how great he is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for being so great and awesome. Lord, uh, thank you for saving our lives and giving us a way to be closer to you and a way to align our lives with you. Uh, just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you 
your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. My beautiful Savior, you have brought me here. Pull me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. My blessed Redeemer, you have set in his cat.
we come to our time of communion, I'd like to tell you a short story that started about 10 years ago. But before I do that, I want to read Proverbs 22, 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. It was May 15th, 2011. That was the first time my family and I ever came to Southwest Christian Church. And we've been here ever since. We didn't know a single person when we first came here. We had never met Pastor Randy. We didn't know any of the deacons at the time. We didn't know anybody. And we brought Calissa in her pumpkin seat and sat back there in the back on the right. And we've been here ever since. She's been to this church all but almost two months of her entire life. She's 10 years old. That was over 10 years ago. Now fast forward to today, I found out this past week that Calissa has been going to another church. Seriously, she has been going to another church. She and her friends started a virtual church that's by kids, for kids, that are around her age. And she goes to it every night. This past week, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, they listened to three songs, they prayed, they gave an invitation to any of their friends that wanted to accept Jesus and they had church she was late for supper but they had church but i think that's a good reason to be late for supper and the reason why i brought this up is because this church has helped raise calissa in christ it's our job as her parents to lead her down the path but this church has helped raise her and helped make her the the person and daughter of god that she is today and i wanted to thank this church for that so as we come to our, to our time of communion, pull it out. The blood that represents, the, the, juice, the juice that represents the blood that was shed for us was shed for every man, every woman, and child. And the body that is represented by the bread was broken for every man, woman, and child. Now I'm going to look at the camera real fast. If you're out there in Facebook land or you're going to be watching this on YouTube and you don't have a home church, Give Southwest a try. We love Jesus, we love kids, and we love you. So as we come to the time to partake of our communion, if I can get this open, let us never forget the message behind it and never forget what it means. for not cooperating on me. Okay. He took the bread and he broke it and he passed it amongst his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take you and eat you all of it. And then he took, after that he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which was poured out for the remission of sins. Drink you all of it. thank you for everything you do for us again you are an amazing wonderful God and Savior and the little bit that we have to give back to you comes from you and we give it to you in a joyful way and I pray that it's something that can be uh, used in a mighty way Lord every bit that we have is yours and I just thank you for it in Jesus name amen
this morning I'm a Christian. Did you all know that? I'm a man of God. I truly believe in what God's Word teaches, and I believe in Jesus Christ, and I'm willing to lay down my life for that because I know the truth means more than anything else around us. No matter what family, friends, community, world, anybody, the Bible literally teaches there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing more important than that. We just celebrated communion together in that. So I want you to know I am a Christian. I am a child of the Most High God, and I'm here to preach His Word. And today I want you to share in that as we do that together. I want to do a quick exercise before we pray. The reason I want to do this exercise is because I want you to understand, as a man of God, as a child of God, as a preacher, as a man that tries to put his whole life down for Jesus Christ genuinely, authentically, I, if you guys want to see my life, I would like for you to walk with me for 24 hours, to spend a week with me, because I want to authentically live every moment of my life for Jesus Christ. Is that where we're at today? With that in mind, I get up here Sunday after Sunday. There's been Sundays I've got up here to preach that I was on the mountaintops. There's been Sundays I've gotten up here and it's been the absolute worst week of my life. There's been Sundays I've gotten up here after I've lost a loved one. There's been Sundays after I've got up here to preach that I've been probably not feeling the best or sick. There's been Sundays I've gotten up here where I felt like my heart had been ripped out of me and I didn't even want to get out of bed. But I've been here to preach the Word of God. Me? How many of you have been here on a Sunday like that? How many of you have been here on the Sunday after a child has been born? Or we rejoice and we're happy and we're excited? Or the Sunday you hear that you drug yourself out of bed to be here? So here's the exercise. And especially out of Psalms and Proverbs, but what does God tell us He is to us? You know, think in the Psalms and the Proverbs. I'll give you one. He says he's our fortress. What other kind of pictures does he use in the scriptures to describe himself to us? Any come to mind? A tower, a refuge, our maker, a strong shelter, our redeemer, our healer, protector, our strong rock, our solid rock, our father. Yes. I mean, think of all these words that are used to describe God. And no matter what's going on this morning with you joining to worship today in this time of the teaching of God's Word, think on those words. That's who He is to us. And we get the opportunity to hear His truth and His way of life for us, the right way, the truth. So with that in mind, let's pray. And we'll get into that study. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, the honor. You are so worthy of it. We know that you are the source of hope, life, truth. And this day we rely on that truth. And we come to study that truth. And we want to be a part. We want our eyes to be open, our hearts to be open. We want to learn from you. We want you, Holy Spirit, to lead, guide, and direct us. So, what, Lord, we're praying for the powerful today, the supernatural, that you, Lord God, would touch us and direct us. That your word, your truth, your Bible would continue to inspire and challenge us and direct us in life. We're your servants, and we're willing to do whatever you want us to do. We want to make room for you. Uh, Lord, we want you to take over. So, Lord, direct us in that this day. Uh, we praise you, Jesus, for the price that you paid for us and for salvation. And then, and Holy Spirit, we trust in you now as we go into this time of teaching. So in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so with some of these thoughts, looking at the screen here, how many of you have ever slept outside overnight? Anybody ever slept outside overnight? All right. I've done this a few times. And this picture up here that's kind of behind there as the sun is rising and that first light that comes, um, you know, I was thinking on this because when I was in high school, I was in Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout, got to uh, learn a lot of things in that. Uh, but one of the exercises one weekend, I was in, in this group that they would challenge you. It is supposed to have been like this elite, more group of guys that was out there in these challenges. And uh, one of our exercises was one time they took us out in the middle of the campground area, this huge area, and they gave us a piece of plastic. And you had your backpack or your sleeping bag or whatever, but they said, here's your piece of plastic. Now go sleep outside by yourself. No one else around. Well, if you've ever experienced that, you know how it is to sleep through the night outside. 
Uh, you hear the squirrel, you think it's a mountain lion. You know, a uh, raccoon or whatever, you think it's the, the army of the dead coming to get you. Whatever the case is. You know, and so I spent my night outside, weeds and about this high, you know, so I had to smash it all down, uh, that kind of a place. And I remember this vividly, you know, to see that first light of the sun. Praise the Lord. It's morning, you know, and you can see, oh, it was that squirrel. You know, it, oh, you know, it was these little things that were bothering me. Um, in this world we live in, and everything that's happening so rapidly around us in our culture, the things we were hearing on TV, social media, friends, family, workplaces, you know, we see the sign up here in, in the corner that says lost, confused, unsure, unclear, perplexed, disoriented, bewildered. You know, we're looking for that light. We're looking for that first sign of dawn, you know, that the Lord has come to have clarity. Isn't that what we're doing in this place today? We're here to praise Jesus Christ, but we're here for clarity. We're here to be on that right path and straight, to have that confidence and hope. And so I had that picture in mind as I was thinking about it today. And, and uh, anybody recognize this picture? I can't remember how many months ago this has been, but we went through this series a number of months ago where we talked about driving the bus. And we talked about who's driving the bus. Literally, your life, who you are, who's driving the bus. And, you know, I've really been thinking on this this last week because there's been a number of conversations with family, friends, things I've seen on social media where it's like, how in the world are you coming to these conclusions of life? Who's driving your bus? And here's some of the results I've seen over the last few weeks. Friends. A lot of times, when truth is supposed to be in the driver's seat, it's really our friends that's in the driver's seats. Praise God, you know, what Adam was saying with Calissa, that her friends are seeking God together. Awesome. But I'm here to tell you, as a, your pastor, your preacher, and your friend up here today, a lot of you, your grandchildren, your children that are in school, things of that nature, God is important to a lot of those kids, but it's their friends that have taken over the driver's seat. And we need to be aware of this. And we need to be the ones pointing back. we got to have truth in that driver's seat. All these things up here, our feelings, our family, our work, our friends, our experience. These things are okay. They're going to shape us and they're going to affect our worldview of things. But if the Bible and God and truth is not driving the bus, then all those other things are going to try to take that seat. And if those things take the seat... You're not going to be on the right path. That's why it's so crucial for us in this house that we get the Bible in us. This last week, one of our elders in this church said to me that he was about to wrap up the Bible reading for the year. And I was a little perplexed at first because I was like, well, now wait a minute. We're supposed to be doing this together every day. We're supposed to talk these things over. And then I thought to myself, Steal your moron. We're in such trouble. There's such things going on in this society right now. Things happen in my family, extended family, friends, workplaces, this community. That it was like a light bulb went on on me. It's my goal now. I don't care how far ahead I get. I want the Bible two, three, four times a year. I want the Bible to be so ingrained in my mind and heart that it's all I think about. Because, man, you all remember the illustration of the counterfeiter that was, you know, an expert on counterfeit money? Remember what he, he told the person that said, how, how many thousands upon thousands of counterfeits have you looked at and studied? You remember what he said? Zero. Why? His answer was, I study the authentic. And I know the real, like, $100 bill so well that any counterfeit I instantly recognize. Are you those folks? You know, I, I think, and I, and I hear people say things that are contrary to the Word of God or posted on their pages. I see people that attend churches and say these kind of things, and I think to myself, what in the world has happened? 
and I ask folks, have you read the Bible? You know, I have literally have messaged people, not necessarily any of you in this room, okay? But I've literally messaged people online before and said, what Bible are you reading from? This is not true to God's Word. How do we solve this problem? We repent. We recognize what the truth is. We say, Lord God, I've been guilty of this. I don't know your word. I need you, Jesus. I need the truth. I can no longer survive seeing this stuff on TV, listening to my friends, hearing what's happening to my family, unless I get strong. So I'm here today as your pastor, your preacher, your friend to tell you, we got to get strong. We have a responsibility to our grandchildren and our children and our future great-grandchildren and all this. We have a responsibility to, to be strong, to be the light of Jesus Christ, and to know the Word of God. So we are the ones that are responsible to get that truth to them. Because I'm here to tell you right now, you think your kids and your grandkids may be okay, but their worldviews are far vastly different than yours. Ask them. Talk to them. Ask them questions about taxes, money, government, sexuality, all of these kind of things. You're going to be shocked. Because what you think is so fundamental that they would understand and grasp from you and what you believe? Uh-uh. The bus has gone off the rails. Or should I say the train? Who's driving the bus? As we jump into the last chapter of Micah chapter 7, I want you to think on this. There's a commercial that was going around with the Olympics. It's a quote from Zig Ziglar. It's been given to a couple other people as a source too. But it says, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to be start, or you have to start to be great. This is a reminder for us in this room. You may be the person in here that couldn't even pass a Bible 101 test, Okay. You may not even know who split the Red Sea. I'm here to tell you, I don't care. This is what I care about, is that you're in this room. That you know God is God, that Jesus is His Son, and we're here today to get strong in that Word. We're going to make a commitment today. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow and I'm going to get strong because I am sick and tired of seeing the devil, seeing Satan, take my family, take my friends, and destroy them and kill them for all eternity. Enough is enough. I'm going to get strong. And we're going to do it together. I'll tell you, I'm excited because we're getting ready to do an outreach program here. But in the lead up weeks to that, we got to start working out. We got to get rid of the junk. We got to start exercising and we got to get ready. This is our call to all of us in this room. As we look at this last chapter, first thing, again, Micah says, enough is enough. It's got to stop. The nation of Israel, the nation of Judah is going to be destroyed. The time has come. It's over. I'm not putting up with it anymore. And this is the first thing he says in chapter 7, this, or this last chapter. Uh, it says, the godly have been swept away you guys ever feel that way you look around you and you're like what is going on in this world it feels like the righteous the godly the people with common sense anybody that understands has been swept away this is what it says in these verses what misery is mine i am like the one who gathers summer fruit after the gleaning of the vineyard there is no cluster of grape seed none of the early figs that i can cr that i crave literally what it's saying is i go out it's time to pick the harvest and there's nothing there the fruit is gone the godly have been swept from the land not one upright man remains all men lie and wait to shed blood it's talking about this general characterization that at that time people's minds were on evil you remember what it said in Noah's time before he built the ark? It said that every intention or every thought of man was on evil. There was no thought of good. There was no thought of helping your fellow neighbor. It was all evil thought. And this was the condition of Israel at this time. And it's a condition that we're starting to see around us all the time. You know, I can remember back in the olden days, the good times, when you saw somebody in need, you saw somebody on the side of the road, what'd you do? You stopped and helped. Your first thought was to be good and to help. Nowadays, it's those 
Oh, should I stop in hell? Are they just waiting to rob me? Is somebody going to hurt me? These are those kind of thoughts that go through our heads. It goes on to say, each hunts his brother with a net. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The, the, the ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. Any of you guys ever cut down brush or anything? Man, I've been doing a bunch of this this summer. Those thorn hedges are terrible. I've got, I, well, you want me to pull up my pant legs? You can see the scratches and tears in my skin from cutting all this stuff. You ever been there? And yet, what is the description that it uses in the scripture here? Why do we have this picture? It says that the best of the people, the best of the people in Israel at this time, the best of the Judeans, we're like a thorn hedge. Wow, that's a great description, isn't it? Hey, you know what? I've got grandkids, and my best one is as good as a thorn hedge. That's never a description you would use of your kids, right? Hopefully not. And yet this is a description we have of God, of his people, his chosen people. The condition, how bad things have gotten. Goes on. The second part, and this is the one that is the kicker, it's time. The time, as we can see in the picture here, the time's up. The hourglass is over. The sand has dripped through. It's come, and the time of judgment is upon this nation. The time of uh, collapse, the time of them being carried into captivity has come. And this is what it tells us. The day of your watchman has come, the day God visits you. When it talks about the watchman, what it literally is saying is that the prophets, the one that had been proclaiming that these things are going to happen unless you repent and turn back to the Lord. Even all the way up to this time that we're reading about, God was literally saying, even at this very moment, if you would just confess, turn your life over me, follow my ways, none of this will come. But they wouldn't do it. So he said, the time is up. Enough. It says here, now is the time of their confusion. Do not trust a neighbor. Put no confidence in a friend. Even with her who lies in your embrace, be careful of your words. For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are members of his own household. Again, talking about the condition of things. And a lot of you are probably sitting in this room going, oh man, this kind of sounds like what's happening around me today. Is it not? Now, hopefully we into the condition that we are here. They're still good people. You know, every once in a while, lo and behold, somebody will hold a door open. Every once in a while, I find myself in trouble. Someone comes along to help. Praise God. That's great. There's still some good people. But the condition of Israel and Judah at this time, it was terrible. Not to say there wasn't those people. There was always the remnant of God's people. But the nation as a whole had turned to this. You couldn't even trust the people in your own house, your own wife. This was the condition of the nation. Now, that first section, these first six verses, doesn't that sound awesome? Anybody want to write some Hallmark cards now? But we jump in at ver verse 7, and this is the one that we're all about in this room. I'm loving this phrase anymore, and it's this phrase, but God. And, you know, we watch the news this last week. We see everything in Afghanistan going completely south. We see the nation of Haiti being destroyed by earthquakes once again. We see all these terrible things in the news. But my friends, I ain't going to sit around and go, Oh, woe is me. Oh, no. I better not leave the house today. No, when I see a news report like that, I'm going to say, oh, But God. And if they make it illegal for us to meet here in church, and they come and arrest me for preaching the word of God or telling the truth, I'm going to say, oh, but God! Because God is bigger than that. God is stronger than that. God is righter than that. Never, ever forget it. And this is what it says. seven, Verse 7, But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior, my God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, 
The Lord will be my light because I have sinned against him. I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and establishes my right. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Do you hear what's being said there? No matter how der- terrible things get, how difficult things get, God is still God. And we can say that for you, but God. And even in the midst of what Micah writes here, he says, I may be down, but I'm still with God. And even us, even us in this room, even those who claim to be Christian, even those that go to church, I, I don't see it up here because I'm perfect. You guys got to understand that. I'm human. That's what I was saying. And when I get up to preach, I still have feelings. Literally, I said to Lewis across the aisle here just a few moment, minutes ago, property taxes came in. Anybody get your property taxes? I haven't, I haven't even opened those daggum things. I'm not going to look at them probably till tomorrow. Monday stink anyway, so I'll open them then. Wait, I can't say that every day is of the Lord. It's great. But you get what I mean. It's real. And as Christians, we still mess up. We still have problems. But did you catch what it says? I will stay before the Lord. And when I mess up, I'm going to turn to Him. I'm not just going to hang my head. I'm going to turn to my Father that loves me, that redeemed me, the one that can give me the strength to go on, the one who can make me better. That's what we're in the room for today, to get strong, to get powerful in Jesus Christ so that we can show this world what is true and right. This next part goes right into that verse 10 through 13. And it says, for us to arise from downfall. And I've always said this, and you've heard it from this pulpit over the years. Our greatest opportunity to show Jesus Christ is a lot of times when we mess up. You ever said anything that you shouldn't have said to somebody? Yep. You ever done stuff that you shouldn't have done or made mistakes? Yes, certainly. But the difference with you and I is we reach out, we humble ourselves, we apologize, we try to make things right, we, we try to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Anybody a Marvel fan, like superhero movies, things of that nature? I'm going, a little old, going to go a little old school for you because I'm a real, I really go for this stuff. The fight between good and evil. But I'm going old school with Captain Marvel today. Anybody know who Captain Marvel is? All right. Take a little gander at this. Again, a little setup here for you. Captain Marvel is going to have a little playback of all these times that she's been knocked down. Watch the video here. All right, that's my favorite clip from Captain Marvel. If you haven't seen it, it's Captain Marvel, the movie. And any of you that are Marvel or followers of that kind of stuff, I still don't understand why Captain Marvel just can't beat everybody out there. I mean, she is, like, super powerful. All right, anyway, that's a side note. Point being, the reason that's my favorite clip is because it shows her after she's been knocked down, she's been made fun of, she's been in an accident, but she gets up and tries again this is the message for us christian people you get knocked down you get discouraged you 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 hear statements about hey you need to be in the bible and you're thinking to yourself well i'm two weeks behind in my bible reading man i feel like a total heel so what today is the day we get up if we don't get up we ain't going to be strong we got to get up we got to force ourselves. we got to discipline ourselves. That's what we're here for. We talk about this outreach program coming up September, I believe it's 12th. 
and we're talking about getting the whole family involved in that and doing this stuff, we need strong people. And I want every one of you to be strong. This is what it says in the Word. Then my enemies will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said to me, where is your Lord, your God? My eyes will see her downfall. Even now she will be trampled underfoot like mire in the streets. The day for building your walls will come. The day for extending your boundaries. In that day the people will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt. Even from Egypt to the Euphrates. And from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. The earth will become desolate because of its inhabitants as a result of their deeds. The statement that Micah is making is that even in the midst of Jerusalem, Judah, Israel's demise, that God will return his people and Israel will once again be established, that they will grow strong, and that the people, the other nations, are going to see it. Now, there's a little statement here in verse 13. It says that the earth will become desolate because of their inhabitants as a result of their deeds. What is that a statement to? Again, it's to the justice of God. That he doesn't just overlook sin. Matter of fact, we read in Hebrews today in Sunday school that uh, for those that have claimed Jesus Christ, that to deliberately continue on in sinful lifestyle or continue to go about in sin, it can't be. Where is there any sacrifice or mercy for that? Understanding this, the grace of God is far beyond anything we could understand. But when he calls us to that grace, he's calling us to a relationship, to grow up, to mature. They quit being the people that just need the little milk and cookie kind of Christianity to the Christian that are getting into the Word of God and becoming mature, strong in faith. One that are not bent by the wind, you know, blowing like those sea reeds by the pond or the lake. But ones that stand strong like the oak tree. That no matter what comes, they're still standing. This is what we're called to. To arise from downfall. To get strong. To be faithful and true. That no matter what, I'm going to be here. Praising and worshiping the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, one quick backup there. Verse 13. Any of you ever heard this campaign to save the earth? To save the planet? All those kind of campaigns? Do you realize that's not what those campaigns are all about? Did you know that? It really should be to save ourselves or to save our hides. The earth is going to continue on. It's us that's going to die. And that's what it says here. The earth will become desolate because of the inhabitants. We, it's about us. And God is the one that directs us how to have all that. Just remember that. As we go into the last part of it, verse 14 through 17, what are we supposed to do? You guys know this. Show what? Show Jesus. And that's it. And as we put this picture up there, can you make that picture out? The kitten looking in the mirror, and what's he see? I'm a lion. And here's the reason I put that up there, because I couldn't find a picture like this. But when we look in the mirror, what should we see in the mirror? You know, oftentimes I'm like, I can't get this one spot of my hair to lay down. It drives me crazy. Or have any of you noticed that? Just say you didn't because it'll make me self-conscious. And I'll go home and start putting water on that. But we look in the mirror and we start to see all of our downfalls. Or we look in the mirror and say, man, what is wrong with you? Why do you have so much weight on you? What are you doing? Why are you so dumb? You know, we start doing that stuff in the mirror. When we should look in the mirror and we should see Jesus Christ. And that's what the scripture teaches that as we claim the Father, the holiness, being the child of God, the mighty man of God, the mighty woman of God, that when we look in the mirror, we see Jesus. And then when we walk out into this community, we're the reflection of Jesus to everybody we come in contact with. As it goes on here in the last part of this, it says, Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest. In fertile pasture lands, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. Nations will see and be ashamed. 
deprived of all their power, they will lay their hands on their mouths and their ears will become deaf. Do you hear what it's saying there? All these nations around them are going, ha, look, Israel got theirs. Remember how the Edomites did that? Remember how all the other nations were destroyed around them as well? This is what it says. They're going to cover their mouths and ears because they're going to be like, oh, we shouldn't have said those things. Goes on. They will lick dust like a snake, like creatures that crawl on the ground. They will come trembling out of their dens. They will turn in fear to the Lord our God and will be afraid of you. You, you catch all that? The power of God, of Jesus Christ, the one who can turn things in a moment or in a decade. This is the hope. This is the promise. As we read in Sunday school class today, the promise of the one, our Savior, our God, the faith that we have in Him is what holds us to be unswerving in our faith. When everybody else in this world says something is right and we know biblically it's not, we don't join in. When everybody else says this is what we should do and the Bible says not, then we don't do it. I just was finishing up uh, Jeremiah here the other day. And when I read the end of Jeremiah, do you know what's in there? It's talking about the last few people that are living in, around Jerusalem after all this warfare has happened. And after the city has been destroyed, they've ripped down the walls, they burnt the temple, and these people are kind of left in the open land. And they come to the prophet Jeremiah and they say, what should we do? Let's go to Egypt. Maybe they can protect us. And they said, you know what, Jeremiah, anything you tell us from God, anything you pray, we're going to do it. We're God's people. We will do whatever he asks us. And so what happens? Jeremiah prays. Ten days later, he gets the answer. And God tells him, listen, I know that it seems totally contrary to anything in your mind and heart, but you stay right where you're at. If you will stay here, I will protect you, and I will make you flourish. Well, the people of God were like, oh, hallelujah. Is that what happened? No, they said to the prophet of God, you're a liar. And not only that, we're going to force you to go to Egypt with us. And what happened? Well, Babylon, the King Nebuchadnezzar, the one that caused all their troubles in the first place, he comes to Egypt. He comes down there, and then he destroys them too. And he destroys the Israelites that are there, the Jews. What's the point? I don't care what things look like. Whatever's happening in your house right this week, this day. I don't care what this world says. If it's contrary to the Bible, then you stick with God in the Word. And if you know something's right, even though your family and everybody else is telling you, nope, don't do it, you do what the Word of God teaches. Because God is the one that will protect you. Remember? Strong fortress, tower, shelter, redeemer, restore, rebuilder, rewarder, Father, God, Lord Almighty, creator of the universe, that guy. That's who I want in my corner. So whether or not you all are with me or not, that's the path I'm taking. Do you get it? And if you're sitting there and you're going, well, even if that preacher up there doesn't take that path, that's the path I'm taking, right? Hallelujah. Last part, this is it. Verse 18, 20, last thing Micah says, who is a God like our God? There's no one like him. Who is a God like you? who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of it is inherited. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on it. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. Do you get it? No matter what a motley crew we are in this room, no matter even the baggage of sin that we bring into this house with us today, no matter how much you've messed up this week, no matter what you've said, no matter what you've done, today is the day. There's no God like our God. Let's get right and straight with Him, get on the right path, and trust Him. 
We're going to work out together and we're going to get strong. And this is kind of the way I've been feeling this week and day as I've been studying. You may see and you may watch church services and you may attend church services and things like that. We're not going to leave any sheet or blanket up in this church. We're not going to tread around the truth or we're not going to, you know, try to uh, spoon feed you baby food. We're going to teach you how to be strong and powerful in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible is our path and our guide to what's right and true. So we're going to get strong in that word. You guys for that? How many of y'all like baby food? We'll throw in some reminders here and there. All right? Quick review for you. Today we looked at the godly have been swept away. A lot of us feel that way. Uh, I know I sometimes am absolutely overwhelmed and floored, and my heart just breaks seeing how things have so quickly changed in our culture. Uh, it's time. And I don't claim to be a prophet, but reading the seasons, the scriptures talks about that, recognizing what's happening. Uh, our country is in an a real big tr trouble and our Republican Party our Democratic Party none of them are going to save us the church has got to arise once again if there's to be any hope and that hope is Jesus Christ so get on your knees and you pray you get strong and we fight third but God and that's it can you all say that but God Remember it. Arise from downfall. Hey, I know y'all mess up. I've been around most of you long enough to have seen that. Okay? I mean, I know some of those closets. And you probably know some of mine. We're getting up. We're arising. Today's the day. Show Jesus. Remember the picture? What did we have the picture of? The kitten. Looking like the lion. You guys probably have kittens like that around your houses. They think they're mighty and powerful. And lastly, who is a God like our God? Never forget, you're in the right place, worshiping the right God. His name is Jesus Christ. He took the weight of the world upon his shoulders, and he destroyed death, won the keys to death in Haiti, and now has given us the opportunity to eternal life. God hasn't put you in some bad, terrible situation. We've made that ourselves. But he's provided the opportunity for our salvation. We are the messengers of that truth. We are the givers of hope. We are the light in a dark world. So you and I, we're going to get strong. And we're going to work out together. And as we prepare for this outreach, we're going to pray. So I'm encouraging you right now, church family, every day this week and following up to that, pray for that burden, pray for that hope, pray for that truth. Pray that we as a church family will be revived and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us to reach this community. We cannot be satisfied for anyone not to know Christ in this city. Anyone! So we pray in the truth of God, but God. Let's bow and pray. Lord Jesus, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. You are so worthy of it. And Lord, we know a lot of times our lives look so messed up and there's so many things going on and we're so contrary to what your word teaches that we need you desperately to clean us up, to wash us, to make us new and fresh, to revive us, that we will walk in your way and your truth, that we would be filled with the Bible, the truth of your word, that we would discipline ourselves. Lord, I pray for the spirit of the hunger of the truth of your word to be on all, each of us, that we would listen to your Bible, that we would read your Bible, that we would get filled with your Bible and truth. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us clarity in the reading of that word and the hearing of that word. And that we as a church family would continue to encourage each other in that word and lift each other up in the truth of that word. Lord, as we worship you, we want to worship you unhindered. We want to cast off the sins that so easily entangle us so that we can be strong and be a light to this world. Lord, we pray for the burden of the salvation of those that have yet to know you or come to know you that we would take seriously the call to reach out to them. 
Lord, I pray for revival on Southwest. I pray for revival in your church in this community. And I pray that you would be Lord and Savior, that we would willingly surrender to you as Lord and Savior of this community. That we would see a revival in this city of Mount Vernon and in this county and in this state and in this nation and in this world. Lord, it's in the truth of who you are that we ask and pray these things. Amen. Would you please stand as our praise team leads us in a time of decision? Been a lot in the sermon today. The Holy Spirit is convicting you of something to step out in faith, to pray, to step out in faith and to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I encourage you to do that right now as we sing this song.
right time to go work out, right? Let's start praying. If you uh, haven't been reading the Bible on a daily basis, find something that works for you. Um, but do it. Uh, whether that's uh, just getting in a chapter a day, uh, if that's you know following the Bible reading program, if you're behind, just jump in where you're at. Don't pay attention to the days. Just start where you're at and, and don't get caught up in that. But do something, you know, that, that's part of getting stronger. And uh, I encourage you, if you need help or ideas, um, lots of us are doing that. So we want to encourage each other and spur each other along in that. And man, I, I'm here to tell you as one that has studied the Bible for a few years now, uh, the more you understand and you understand the geography, you understand the history, you understand the family relationships of, of grandchildren and great-grandchildren and uncles and all that playing into those families back then. It's like, what is this, is this my family's history? I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. And it teaches you. So, anyway, point being, let me get off my soapbox. I'll get to the announcements. But get, at, get strong, okay? Get start working out. Here we go. Soup kitchen. Is August 24th, um, not this week, but next week. So wa be watching for that for donations there. We talked about in Sunday school this morning. A lot of you haven't been in Sunday school or Wednesday morning study. We need to find a place for everybody to be studying in a smaller setting and learning and growing together. It's so, 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 so important. And I want to encourage you to that. We have Bible study 930 on Wednesdays. We have our Sunday morning group. If there's something that you would desire that could work for you or your schedule, come talk to me. We'll try to figure something out and get groups together for that kind of study that works, okay? And then uh, youth group movie night coming up. Uh, Z, what's that, Generation Z? Is that what we were talking about last week? Um, August 27th, 7 to 9. And then August 29th is our fifth Sunday. We'll be having a potluck dinner that day. Is it potluck? Is that what you all say around here? Because where, I, where I'm from, we call it a pitch-in. Doesn't that make more sense? I mean, Pollock just sounds offensive. <laughs> All right? You know, let's see, let's see if anybody, we can get lucky with what you bring. A pitch-in says, hey, we're all working together. All right? So come with Indiana on that phrase, pitch-in. Anyways, that will be August 29th. And then Jeanette wanted me to announce tomorrow at Tri-County from 12 to 4 p.m. there will be a blood drive. Uh, if you're available and able, they really could use your blood. So come out uh, 12 to 4. And also, Jeanette is making her pies for that. So I'll, I'm going to try to be there. Any other announcements? Once, twice, sold. We've got one more song, so don't leave yet. <laughs> What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain. Nothing but the blood of Jesus And nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Jesus Not of good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Jesus And oh precious is the flow White as snow, oh no other pounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Cause the blood of Jesus is enough for me. Oh, the blood of Jesus is enough. But the blood of Jesus in 
makes me white as snow oh no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus everyone have a blessed week